Hello so guys, it's Shinan and this is a 3D printed 110th scale RC card that I worked on for quite a while and it's finally done. So it has two pairs of independent suspensions on the front. It uses an all metal gear cordless servo motor for steering. In the middle, you have a 6 channel receiver, a GPS speedometer, a sensor DSC and two 7.4 volts, two cell LiPo batteries that are connected in parallel. On the back, it has a cooling PC fan and a 3800 kilovolt sensored brushless motor, which is what is needed to get to its top speed. 41 miles per hour. I mean, that's what I got on the speedometer. Okay, so this car is actually not that different from the last iteration I built because it goes a little faster and most of its components are literally just transferred to this new improved body where most of its designing and building aspect takes place. Let's start with the component that looks really simple, but in reality, it's really hard to design the gears. In the last iteration, I was able to get 30 miles per hour using 1 to 1 gear ratio and based on the success of that, I thought I could use 2 to 1 gear ratio in inverse and get 60 miles per hour in theory. I had this dumb idea because last time the motor was able to pull the off to a car which weighed about 1.3 kilograms. So even though the acceleration is gonna be really low, over time in a long road, I thought I could get to that speed or at least close to that. By the way, low gear ratios are not recommended but I'll do the experiment so you don't have to. Okay, so I don't really know my about how to design gears so I just went ahead and printed these two models that I found on Thingiverse then used them just as a reference. Initially I want to implement helical gears because ideally they are used for high speed applications and they can transition power much more smoothly but also they have a major downside and I'll get to that in a minute. So here's how I designed my first gear. First of all you make some variables and define them. Module is the unit size of how big or small a gear is and the pressure angle is the slope of a tooth face. It's basically this tangential line. You use those variables to make equations and draw circles. Then you use some more equations to sketch out a slot in a way so that when you revolve the cut it makes a perfect round. Then you can use some chamfers and fillets as needed. If you want to make helical gear then just cut the slot at an angle using loft cut. Now all you have to do to make PDN per gear is to go in the equation and change the number of teeth. The problem with this method is that it simply doesn't work. It's oversimplified. If you take two same sized gears it works but as soon as you resize it everything falls apart. The gears don't mesh the right way. I tried making a lot of adjustments in the fillets, chamfers, module, pressure angle and even a lot of sanding and I got pretty close in some prototypes but none of them actually worked. It's either the gears barely mesh or it's really rough. So I looked up the proper way of making gears and found out that it's way harder than I thought. If the actual process includes this many equations to work with, there has to be a calculator or a generator for it. To my surprise, there was an add-in generator in SOLIDWORKS all along and I didn't even know about it. There you would get to choose the properties of the gear and there we go, you're done. So I kept taking the wrong approach over and over again till the 8th version and I got it right the one after that. The mesh was just way better, it just worked. And here's why I didn't implement Hilco gears. Axle force. If I turned the small helical gear clockwise while holding the bigger gear still, I would feel an axle force that would want to go towards the camera, and if I turned it the other way, the axle force would be in the opposite direction. I was aware of the whole axle thrust thing, but I didn't know it would have that much force that it would get stuck in the mount so hard that I would need to use some sort of leverage to break it free. Obviously, fixing the dimensions of the shaft would get rid of that specific issue, but after doing that, I faced another one. The axle pushed on the bearing so hard that it sort of got melted and deformed. And if I mount the helical gear on the motor, it's either gonna melt in the body from friction or it's gonna shoot out from the shaft depending on how I want to do the angle. So in the end, I went back to the good old simple straight gears that have a 2 to 1 ratio in the proper order. Okay, so now let's go over the shaft and the wheel hub design. Before making this car, I made the whole open RC just as a prerequisite. Only to make sure that I have a little bit more experience and confidence when it comes to designing and 3D printing parts like that. But the shaft design of that car is uh, kind of questionable. Obviously not being symmetric from its axis of rotation would cause it to go off balance and break from its weakest point. But I wanted to test from a realistic point of view if it can withstand the normal driving conditions. Which it did but you can't really expect it to survive at full throttle. Anyway, all I need to do to solve that problem is to make it symmetric from its axis of rotation. But the one that I printed first didn't come out as well balanced as I thought it would. It was simply because of the print orientation. So instead of printing in um, landscape, I should have done that in portrait. 
it. Here we can see the difference it makes just by changing the print orientation. But even after doing that, the design was still flawed and it still had a lot of vibrations and it broke from its weakest point at a high RPM. The solution to that is to use a 57mm M4 screw that goes through the wheel hub and in the axle. I found out that you can reduce a lot of unnecessary vibrations if you just round it up. That way you can have a lot more surface area that coincides with that face of the bearing and therefore have a better make. And that increased volume in the middle can provide a little bit more mechanical strength when the screw is inserted all the way, especially if the tap tolerance is really low. The wheel hub design is pretty simple and I happen to get it right on the first try which usually doesn't happen. It just slides right in, then the M4 screw goes all the way in, and then you use 4 M3 nuts and screws to mount the wheel. Okay so now let's go over the suspension design. One of the goals of this project was to make things as complete as possible, whatever that means but that's what I tried to do when designing the suspensions. So you can use it in your own RC car or maybe utilize it in a completely different project. So just to lay out the basic idea, the two ball joints have to be there, these two mounts need to be there to hold the spring in place, and there has to be these two parts so the entire top and bottom assembly can slide up and down. Now that I have the basic idea laid out, all I have to do is uh, do everything in real life. I had some weird ideas about designing the suspension which eventually didn't work out, but after sketching a few more iterations, I came up with this design. Everything was nice about it, and it even consisted fewer parts than the final design. But there was one major problem, it wobbles like a lot. The simple obvious solution to that is lowering the tolerance. But if you do that, you won't be able to screw through that part when assembling. And let's say if you forcefully do so, you're gonna enlarge the channel anyway. So I changed a few more things and came up with this design. It was a relief to see this iteration working because it replaces one of the parts that's tedious to make. It's kinda hard to manually sand away a specific portion of the thread and I really didn't want to make three other copies of that. Anyway, this is how much it used to wobble before and here's the after. But the design was still flawed and and it broke from where the small screws go in. You can probably tell why if you just look at the cross section. So I just tried to maximize the diameter in the last iteration and call it a day. It still broke like multiple times throughout 10 days of testing, but you'll be fine as long as you don't crash. Anyway, after that change in design, the wobble was reduced even more. And if you want to lubricate the suspension, then just take one of the screws out, inject some Vaseline, put the screw back in, and there you go. Okay, so now let's go over the suspension and the steering mechanism. If you have two same sized rigid bars that are connected to other same sized rigid bars and if only one of them is fixed this way, the opposite ones are always going to move in parallel. Now you can attach the wheel on the other end and there you go. The wheel is always going to be parallel to the ground. Now you can add the suspension and you have the basic idea laid out. Now all you have to do is do it in 3D. First of all, I had to design this truss figure to hold the suspensions and the wheel assembly to the front bottom plate. As you can see, it entirely consists of triangles and that's because it's the most stable shape. Again, if you have four rigid bars that are connected this way, the opposite ones are always going to move in parallel. But if I remove one of them and make a triangle, it stabilizes. If I apply a downward force on the top while holding the bottom one as it is fixed, the two on the sides are going to be under compression and the bottom one is going to be under tension. You can continue making more triangles and eventually what you will have is a truss figure. You can bear impressive amounts of loads just by using the tension compression concept, which is why you see structures like that in bridges and antenna towers and cranes. One of the requirements for truss figures is that they always have to be connected by pin joints. And if they're not connected by pin joints, what you have is a frame. They are not the same. They don't even act the same way. But I think it gives you a good enough reason to go with triangular cutouts instead of circular or rectangular. Also it depends on how the part was manufactured or I should say how it was printed. Because it's a lot easier to separate the adhering layers than the other way around. So in this case the print orientation matters and it doesn't do any favor for for this part. Anyway, moving on. In the initial design of the suspension and steering mechanism, there were two things that were wrong with it. First, a single suspension per wheel wasn't enough to lift out the front side of the car. Second, the orientation of the servo. If you look at it from this angle, everything looks fine, but if you look at it from the top view, you would see where the problem is. The car would easily lose control while driving if I kept it the way it was. But I figured if you align the links with the arms, you can easily solve the problem. Now, all I have to do is re 
redesign everything. Instead of having just a single suspension per wheel, you now have two, which worked just fine. And in this new mechanism, the steering angle doesn't change as it goes up and down because I was able to align the links with the arms, regardless the motion of the servo. Okay, so now let's go over one of the most important aspects when it comes to designing the car, structural support. If you look at the bottom of the car, you can partially see the three millimeter rods that are used in between the connecting parts. I added another one right at the middle just because I thought I should. For assembly, you just put these two rods in, then slide in the part and screw the screws in. And the same goes for the front assembly. You just have to use one of these screws again to hold the middle rod in place. While we're on the topic, let's go over the structural support of the back. Like I mentioned before, the fan is there to cool down the motor, but it's really inefficient. It's actually there to secure the two axle mounts so they don't bend outwards. The 16mm M3 countersink screws already do a good enough job, surprisingly, but using the fan case as a support really holds it together. Now the last topic for today is rotors and gear ratio. Honestly, the 2 to 1 gear ratio seemed really promising at the beginning. Throughout the entire process, I repeatedly made sure that the motor was able to carry the car's weight and if there was a possibility to reach its full potential. But the first test was nothing more than disappointing. So I swapped the 12.5 to 13.5 millimeter rotor just to see what kind of difference it would make because it seemed like the motor needed more torque. And after driving for a while, I got 20 miles per hour. So that's 5 miles extra. After getting these low numbers, I really gave up the idea of making a fast car and wanted to make something that's fun to drive. Basically, something that has a higher wheel torque. So I changed the gear ratio order and took it out for testing the next morning. The lower gear ratio and the bigger rotor really made it fun to drive but also really hard to control. After a while, I did a speed test at low throttle and I got 22 miles per hour. That gave me a little confidence to go faster but then this happened. Oh god. 33 miles per hour at least that's better so 33 right that's a lot better on day four of testing i didn't have enough time to repair all the parts so i went with the broken ones anyway after driving for a while i got 27 miles per hour also the pla gears melted really bad day five 24 miles per hour on day six i wanted to get some shots of the suspensions working so that's what i did day seven driving in the rain Day 8, speed test again, 34 miles per hour, so 1 mile extra. On day 9, I'm gonna press the throttle all the way and I don't care if it breaks again. Oh, 41 miles per hour. And here are some of the findings that I think are interesting and maybe you can use this information for your own project. One of the viable conclusions that I can draw is lower gear ratios doesn't always result the higher speed. It obviously has a sweet spot. All the steel files and some other instructional PDFs are available for you to download and make this exact project on my Patreon. The way I run this YouTube channel is not very sustainable as you can probably tell and it's really hard to keep going when there's not enough revenue. This video is just a summary of how I made the 41 miles per hour RC car but the actual process includes a lot of failures and a lot of prototypes which take months to make. So all the future project files are gonna go in my Patreon but the ones that are already available for free on Thingiverse are gonna stay that way. But anyway that's been it thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.